This is After Immunity, a UMFM limited series that aims to explore the questions surrounding what our individual and collective worlds will look like after we've gained immunity to COVID-19. Join me, Ian T.D. Thompson, as we explore five topics to understand the post-COVID-19 world. Today's episode is part two of our examination of Manitoba's music scene. On today's episode, we talk with Stephen Carroll, Director of Music Programs at Manitoba Film and Music. And if you are listening live on UMFM, stay tuned to the end of the interview for a selection of music by Manitoban artists curated for your listening pleasure. In the series, we have explored Canada's local arts scene and how it may evolve in the post-COVID-19 world. In our second episode, we chatted with Debbie Werner from the Toronto Jewish Film Festival and Faye Thompson from the School of Contemporary Dancers. We learned how these organizations weathered the pandemic and what trends may last after immunity. However, in exploring Canada's local art scene, we have chosen to do a deep dive into Manitoba's local music scene. That is, how will Manitoba's music scene transform in the post-COVID-19 world? For context, Manitoba's 2020 summer was not affected to the same extent by the pandemic as other regions like Ontario. It was faced with rather low case counts of the virus. Under this climate, outdoor concerts and social distance seating at venues gave Manitobans a sense of normalcy during a rather unprecedented time. However, in the fall, cases rose and necessary restrictions were put in place to slow the spread of the virus. As such, in-person events, tentatively scheduled during the low case counts, were fully cancelled as the province locked down. Since then, Manitoba's music scene has seen its fair share of virtual concerts and online album releases. In part one of this episode, we spoke with Sean McManus, Executive Director of Manitoba Music, a member-based, not-for-profit industry association in the province, representing members in varying roles and responsibilities in the music industry. Sean spoke about the effects of the pandemic on the province's musicians and artists, what trends may last after immunity, and the importance of government's role in making the sector more sustainable in the long term. In part two of our discussion today, we chat with Stephen Carroll. Stephen Carroll is the Director of Music Programs at Manitoba Film and Music. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you very much, Ian. Happy to be here. So I guess a good place to start us off for the general audience out there, can you give us a sense about what the objective and the goals are for Manitoba Film and Music? What kind of supports do you provide Manitoban artists in the community? Right. So uh, we have two industries that we support that are underneath the creative industries umbrella. We support the music side, which I'm the director of. So the music industry, we're there too support it through delivery of funding support, so grants, essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then on the film side, we have a series of equity investments and tax credits that we manage to nurture the film industry and promote the growth of that format. Mm -hmm. That's a helpful place to kind of, you know, get us a sense about what's the job that you hold and and the role that Manitoba Film and Music has in the art scene here in in the province. So you are someone who has been in the the music industry and the arts scene for a number of years as a musician, as a manager, and now as a director with Manitoba Film and Music. And so I'm really just curious, in your own words, what makes Manitoba's music scene and its talent unique? Right. One of the most self-evident things, but I think also the most true things, is our isolation. Living on a prairie island here, we uh, or an island on the prairies, let's say, an urban island. Uh, mm-hmm. Manitoba's densest population is in Winnipeg. It just tends to pull a lot of the musicians, uh, a lot of the artists to it as a place to work. And that was true historically, too, going back even to it to being a cultural center across the prairies. And we still remain that way, but for a long time, the culture of communities in other Smaller cities, even in Saskatchewan, for example, were not as strong, but they have since grown and flourished, and they have a very strong arts and culture and music scenes as well in those cities. But Manitoba, most of the cultural activity is focused in Winnipeg, and it has a, you know, it's a double-edged sword. We kind of draw a little bit from our the rural communities around us. Uh, a lot of people move to the city to pursue their career in music, pursue their career in the arts, study at, at some of the institutions here further their skills, that kind of thing. 
And that makes us this kind of center point for a whole lot of ideas, a whole lot of interesting energy, a whole lot of creativity. And we're a really pragmatic city in a lot of ways. We are accessible as far as housing goes for most people. And it's a good place for artists who are building their career, building their business, don't have, you know, that haven't hit that sort of mid-career income level to get from starting to that mid-career income level and to establish themselves in a place that's known for its arts, has a reputation nationally, internationally for generating really high quality music, fine art, dance, and other formats, visual arts, um, maybe I said fine arts, which makes it a great place for cultivating your ideas. That melting pot of concepts of uh, people working in different genres, uh, rubbing shoulders with other people with different pursuits, makes a really wonderful, rich cultural atmosphere on our tiny, in a way, remote urban island in the middle of the vast prairie. Mm -hmm. um, that isolation, that eight hours to the largest centers around us really affect, I think, the ideas, the idea sharing. We have ideas here that don't leave the island. They don't translate maybe to a wider, the wider community. We have seen you see that music. We have little music trends that happen here that don't take off elsewhere. But they're really powerful here and they're really compelling to those that are involved. So yeah, those are the initial concepts I think that shape the city. That we're a center in in this prairie region for arts and culture, and we draw in a lot of interesting people who want to create here. And because of the economics of it, it's a place that almost fosters that. People come here for that reason, because you can make a career here as an artist, make a living as an artist, own a house here as an artist, achieve these like kind of lifelong goals that are about stability in your life that you can't have in a lot of cities like Toronto, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, well, the other thing that makes us really unique is we strive, there's an excellence, a fundamental excellence to a lot of the work that comes out of here and a lot of the ideas that are brought forward in the music scene and the arts community in general that do hold water outside of the province, beyond our borders. And I think because we have sort of a unique perspective, that unique perspective shapes the work and uniqueness in art in any sense is one of the most key, most compelling things for making your work succeed and resonate with people. I really appreciate that comprehensive answer, just in terms of, as you said, the little bit of the melting pot of the musicians and the talent here, as well as the economics of it, you know, and being able to have a house and to have a lifestyle as a musician and actually make it here. So this show is focused on that post-pandemic world, but we really can't talk about the post-pandemic world until we talk about the current pandemic that we're still undergoing right now. In the work that you have seen, what has been the effect on the pandemic on Manitoba's artists and musicians? Oh, well, one word answer, it's been devastating. And maybe it's followed up with a second word, <laughs> challenging. A lot of people have found their worlds turned upside down. The plans for releasing records, tour dates, setting their career down a path, taking themselves a little further along professionally, kind of meeting those in the next goals and objectives that they had laid out for themselves. and maybe just in their mind and in the career that they imagined. They've been essentially in park for a year and a bit, unable to achieve those things. And so that's been pretty devastating, but then it's been challenging. And since they had to retrench, they had to sort of reimagine what they were going to do with themselves during this time mm -hmm. and find a productive vision for using this period when they've essentially been forced into uh, lockdowns of various sorts throughout the year here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've seen them uh, on the other side really turn inwards, looking to create new work. From my vantage point, I see a process, a lot of recording applications, a lot of applications for marketing initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing a really big uptake. We had an unprecedented year in the number of applications that we received for our recording program. So that's been really interesting. So a lot of people are really trying, even if they were scheduled to launch a new project right at the beginning last March, a year ago, and that was put in park because of COVID, they pivoted, as people say, and changed their plans to look at creating new work during this time. That all happened, and not right away. That happened after initially absorbing that, that devastation to their plans. And I think on a final point, it's been financially really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people are trying to, you know, wasn't without the federal sports, government sports, and the few programs that we've had provincially, they haven't had a lot of opportunity to uh, make a living the way that they probably have their businesses structured. As you said, you know, there's no other way to say that it has been devastating and been challenging during this time. You mentioned how 
there's been a real uptake in artists who are now recording and everything. And, and as you noted, Manitoba Film and Music is there to help out with the grant funding to get people in the studio. But I'd be curious to know about the agency itself. Has the pandemic affected your ability to support Manitoban artists during this time? How has the organization adjusted? Uh, it was interesting uh, because we were a uh, really analog organization, paper only, largely PDFs, not a lot of digital intake systems. We kind of, I think, enjoyed having the clients come to the door with their paperwork and we'd have a little chat, catch up, a lot of face-to-face interactions. And all of that, of course, quickly went away last March. And the organization itself was able to pivot. We were able to change quickly how we dealt with our clients and update a lot of things. And it was actually a really healthy exercise in a lot of, in, in, I don't know that's real extreme contradiction but it was a very important thing for us to go through as an organization to have to do a bit of a gut check on how we were delivering things look at a total refresh and within a six weeks we had or five or maybe four weeks we had a system to use for managing essentially everything we needed to do with our clients and running even things such as our juries which luckily there's great tools out there we were able to tap into and with a fairly little difficulty or um complications we were able to change to be totally digital within four weeks and not really have any service interruption for our clients. So that was really good for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it was a bit of self-reflection. It definitely was challenging as internally because we needed to reevaluate our whole position on our programs. What's going to be effective in this pandemic? What are the things that artists are going to need during this time? Um, what's going to be obsolete and what can we do for them? So we had to revamp our programs as well. And in terms of the programs, has there been like any big successful initiatives or movements around that, that said that this is really good? And, and I guess I'm trying to tie that a little bit to kind of the future. So you, you've had to make these changes, the shift a little bit to the online format and everything. My question is, you as an organization, has that worked? And what might be sticking in that post-COVID-19 world? Have our programs really worked the way we thought we would, they would work? I would say we were working with a foggy crystal ball when we came up with the program design. We knew that these there were certain issues that everybody's going to face. Travel would be no longer viable, so the tour program would be no longer tapped into as much. Immediately, it was apparent that online concerts were going to be a method of people interacting with their fans, trying to build their business and market their records. We didn't know to the scale to what that was going to be like. As it matured, we had to sort of tweak our programs. And we really didn't know what the situation was going to be with studios and recording or any kind of other production. So we knew that there'd be less cash. So we, some of the big pieces worked. Like we, we increased our funding for certain programs, especially the recording, which might be a sign of that it's working that we've had so many applications. People are looking for that funding and online concerts were not probably as drawn upon as I thought. Initially, everybody was really, really excited about engaging with their fans like this. And then as the market became saturated and matured, they, they started to refocus and only do specific online concerts, things like that. So I'm not too sure we had a really big home run. Like we just did small tweaks. You know, we have, we have a basic framework, which are based on the principal activities of the music business. In a large way, except for touring, remain the same. We definitely saw a really dramatic increase in marketing demands. Mm-hmm. And some of the changes we made worked to support the industry during that time, or during this time, because it's current. But I won't say I have one piece that says we did, this was totally right. And I've talked to our funders across the country and we're all in that mode. Like it's okay. It's working a little bit. It's giving the funds, funds are going out the door and they're being used and they're doing work that they're intended for. So that's good. That's good to know that there hasn't been a, it hasn't been a total collapse of the system and you haven't been able to help out artists during this time. So you still have been able to help them out and kind of achieve some success in that way. I think what's been pretty interesting to see is just how much activity people have been undertaking during this time. And I guess kind of tied to this aspect of activity, you're absolutely right. What we've seen a little bit and what we see just in the news as a whole has been more activity, but different activity. So like you mentioned the online shows, the festivals, as well as artists recording more, producing more during this time. Out of these trends, out of these big kind of shifts in the music industry, what do you think might last? What innovations do you think have succeeded during this time? Yeah, I think that the music industry was faced probably one of the most consequential outcomes of of the pandemic as far as any sort of 
enterprise goes with live being entirely shut down, venues being shut down, recording studios being shut down. It's most avenues for really the core activities of our business were shut down except for online. Mm-hmm. You know, for better or for worse, the entire business runs on for the, the sale of recordings, for the consumption of recordings, it runs online. So in a way, we had a little bit of luck that this happened now. Like if stores were also retail was closed and record sales and had record sales had completely shut off as they, you know, only the sale of vinyl and store products really of new CDs have shut down or in new CDs if you're still buying them. But online consumption has remained really high which was really fortunate for the music industry in, in a way, though the royalty rates, of course, paid in the new formats are really low. Uh, and it's only the top earners that are making really good money. You have to be in that top 5% or something to earn good money off of your streams. That said, there's a lot of ancillary royalties, which support the back end of this. So broadcasting has still been undertaken. So that has really helped stabilize us through here. I think what pieces we're going to take from this experience of moving essentially our entire business model online, I think what I'm noticing is that we're going to see people, the success you can have with really strong online marketing campaigns that are cutting edge, that cut through the necessity of engaging with the streaming services as a high level to play their games and use the algorithms. Like people are figuring out how to, let's say, refocus them just being a live band to, okay, what do we need to do to build these really work with the algorithms in Spotify and the governing structures of these digital service providers such as Apple and whatnot to maximize their engagement with their fans and see that parlay into essentially a snowball effect. I think people are grasping the, the sort of fundamental concepts of online marketing and the interplay with social media and the digital services and how it's a sort of snowball effect. And the more you push it, the theory, if the music is good, if the music is good and the people <laughs> you're getting engagement, the snowball gets bigger and you have a wider fan base. So I think we're going to see a bit more focus on that than we have just people banging it out in clubs, going out for 200 dates, playing to empty rooms. I think people are going to take the wisdom they're learning from this sort of bird's eye view you get of your career that the digital platform social media provide because there's so much data. And most people, most artists, musicians, managers are often really are often too busy doing the regular day to day to look at this data sometimes and see the bigger picture of their career that's just lying there in front of them. I'm already seeing this with certain artists that are looking at this information now as a way of planning what they're going to do next. But also as the driver, like this information is the driver. So that I think is probably one of the more subtle, not as present probably to the regular consumer, like somebody is maybe more passively engaged with music than somebody like myself who's more in the back end. I think on the front end for consumers, they're gonna, we're going to have periodically on like online concerts will be a thing that will happen to some degree going forwards because there's certain economics be very beneficial. Pay-per-views always existed with music and various performance arts, but it was very niche in a lot of ways. I think the pandemic has obviously broadened that tremendously, democratized it, essentially taking it from a cable sort of specialty provider situation to more sophisticated. We're seeing online concerts be go from iPhones to full production in venues with gated ticket sales that have a region in which you can access it and People are trying to do these virtual tours using sort of these geo-protected concerts. So that will still remain a thing because there's economics. I don't know if you've heard any of these stories, but you know, certain artists will do, you know, in an 800 cap room, they'll go in to set up to do a live performance that for online. They don't geo-target it. And so it means it's open to everybody. And they can have a hundred thousand people there in the concert, you know, far exceeding the natural capacity of the venue. So mm-hmm. there's a benefit for that, but it has to be done strategically because because of the competitive nature of live environments, promoters who are working in live concerts who are coming, you know, will be going back online fully next year in theory. They don't want to see that kind of competition. So I think you'll see a very limited amount of that. Like, I don't think everybody's going to be going, oh, we're only doing online concerts. Now, some artists probably will, perhaps if their format works really well like that. We'll see them going into the video game format, like doing specialty concerts in, you know, video game platforms, wherever there's a really niche audience that they can sort of tap into. Those things will continue if it's art specific, like for if it's suitable, as with a lot of arts in general, but specifically music delivery is really specific to whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. So you know, if you're a folk artist, chances are you're not going to be jumping in to be doing online concerts in a video game situation. Well, maybe you will, uh, but you may do a select few of 
a really nice, like if you're established a specialty show for yourself and you're a national to international audience. But I think those live rooms are still going to play a big role for a lot of genres. And I don't really see that changing historically. It's, we've always gone to concerts, <laughs> you know, the history. Live music, it's, it's, it's something that's very hard to recreate in a two-dimensional situation. VR is coming online, but it's not, again, I don't think going to have, it's going to be niche. It'll work a certain, it'll be a specialty sort of add-on thing you can do. Stephen, I really appreciate that answer. You gave a really, again, in-depth perspective on the different directions that this can kind of all play. As someone who deals with data, you know, I think that's fascinating being able to kind of, because it sounds like the music industry and being able to make it as a musician, it requires you to be a little bit more strategic in how you perform or where you perform and what markets do you perform compared to in the past where you would just kind of do the bar scene or do kind of a tour around Western Canada. Is that a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, this, I think what's happened is the strategy has become, you can have no strategy right now. <laughs> it actually, mm-hmm. you can do things in a way where the rule book is it's yours to decide. Like typically, a lot of the structure of the music business was built around a live concert. So you'd launch your album sometime around or launch a single, then go out with your do some tour dates, or maybe only tour once the full record was out. Mm-hmm. And that was really structured. Now, with uh, like people are launching records without those live tour dates, is giving us really great flexibility. If there's an like, a, let's for instance, if there's an issue, you're about to launch a record, you're you're not doing any live dates. You just have some online concerts. Maybe an issue comes up, like oh, there's a power outage. It wipes out Texas. Something terrible happens, right? It's, you know, uh, something like this. It's just like oh, we don't want to do this now. We have a big following in Texas. Normally, if that happened while well, you had a giant set of 30 tour dates throughout America or whatever, 45 dates, rebooking all that, resetting everything would essentially make the whole enterprise fall apart like a house of cards, right? You take out those other pins and it collapses with the digital model. You don't have that concern because you can just bump it back two weeks. You can bump it back three weeks, you know? You can just be a little savvy with your marketing and steer around issues like this in a way that gives you makes you more nimble yeah as you said it makes you more nimble there's a little bit more increased flexibility in it yeah and i'll say the downside though too is there's a congestion online of course right we all have limited screen time we're 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 working in it and coming out of this we're all you know we're going to continue probably to use zoom in some capacity it's become the standard why would it not why would it change i don't think we're abandoning it for going back to traditional conference calls anytime soon and you know that plays into how much consumption you want to do for your entertainment do you want to be sitting down in front of your computer or your tv again for your night every night like sure you want to have your tv nights but music and performance arts will provide that relief of us, you know, being around people, being in an environment with the sort of unique energy and the concerts go out of the way to create an atmosphere. I mean, you know, we're sitting at home. It's very hard to pick up that atmosphere. So those pieces, I think, will, you know, have a bit of a dampening effect on how much digital consumption we will do. And so another piece is, you know, because live was always such a trigger for marketing, it was one of the foundational pieces you needed to get attention from media. Like if you had sort of that little tweak that pushed you over the top, it's like, okay, maybe we won't do this story on you because you're not going to be in my town this week, uh, or we won't get you on the radio in our, for an interview because you're not literally not going to be here. But when you were there and you were in a physical presence in that city or whatnot, and you were able to go into those radio stations, you had that sort of singular attention of that person because of all those factors. Now we're missing that kind of leverage and it's very, very congested from media coverage for artists of any kind of media, radio to a print. Mm-hmm. I want to switch directions a little bit and talk about a little bit of your role, I guess, and as well as the kind of the higher level government support for artists and everything. Again, your work with Manitoba Film Music, it is a provincial agency. So I would just be curious, in your own words, what is the role of government in aiding the local art scene here in Manitoba, particularly after the pandemic is over? How might it help the musicians to think along these future oriented ways that you've just been talking about? Our core function remains as it always has to aid the growth of the music industry here and try and make sure that our programs are as impactful as they can be, that every dollar we give goes out to try and enable success in some capacity for the artist, give them the chance to do something that they couldn't have done without this fund. And that won't change. And you know, every year we're kind of tweaking our programs a little bit to the left, to the right, to figure out where the trend is that we need to adjust to, because 
you know, the business will follow trends and delivery models. And every 10 years the music business shifts, right? It's a whole new format and we pivot, but the main pieces still remain there. Marketing is still something you have to generally hire somebody before, but the specialists change. So specialists will be a streaming marketing person who has a list of the top playlist curators and will market your stuff there. Or somebody who's, uh, you know, digital PR now means actually analyzing your, your followers, analyzing your Spotify streams, gathering that data, cultivating it into something that you can use as a tool for planning your releases and targeting your marketing and those kind of things. So I don't think we're going to see a big I don't think our role will change after this pandemic because like we haven't seen the next format. Like we will change when that next format comes. Mm -hmm. But right now we're still in streaming and we're so deep in streaming right now. And I think it's maturing as a business and our programs will, as that starts to change shape slightly, as it moves, as it ages, we will tweak and just nudge things along, trying to make sure that the programs encourage the best use of the best practices and they're not built on old thinking. And I think that's maybe the game that we always play. It's like having the fundamental ideas that we need these basic guide things. We need receipts for your expenses and things, mm-hmm. functionality of our grant programs, of any grant program. We're going to give you money. You're going to account for it. And you got to give us something back. Uh, <laughs> so those are the only things we say. But then we want to make sure that the rules that we have are not built on Stone Age thinking. You know, we're actually in a streaming era or we're not marketing wax cylinders. We're encouraging the marketing of wax cylinders when really it's virtual reality concerts that people are going to or something. So that's, we leave, I think our goal and maybe our responsibility is to leave the programs. I think responsibility as a government agency is to have a stable program that functions in a way that the artists and stakeholders both see the value and that there's responsibility and ownership of, let's say, um, these, these programs. Responsibility for <laughs> probably following all their guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. And then, but also just enough open to allow for that thing that we can't see. Just like I said, when we started the pandemic, when we have a foggy crystal ball. In the music business, you always have a foggy crystal ball in some way because you don't really know what that next technological change is going to be that's going to shift the delivery of music. Who would have thought 10 years ago that we would all be listening to our music from a cloud, a cloud-based server? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like literally, we don't own music anymore. We are all listening to it in the cloud-based server somewhere, probably in Oregon, so. <laughs> uh, the yeah, Amazon yeah. server, whoever backs Spotify. So the, the, that's, I think, our responsibility as we come out of the pandemic is, again, we make sure that we don't have gates that are closed to that potential for change that we can't see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of being prepared for the unexpected new next way that people consume uh, Manitoba music. Stephen, this has been a very interesting conversation and, and just being able to get a little bit of a sense about the industry here in Manitoba and Manitoba Film and Music's place in that, as well as your own thoughts and just where this post-COVID-19 world might be headed in terms of, of how musicians and how Manitoba's artists can make it in the local art scene, as well as nationally and internationally. I have two last questions. I guess the first one might be, you know, for the listeners out there that are curious about uh, the services of the agency, where might you guys them to? Yeah, everything we have for our programs are listed on our website. It's mbfilmmusic.ca. Perfect. And I guess, do you have any final thoughts in terms of the Manitoba local art scene and how it might evolve in the post-COVID-19 world? What I'm seeing right now too, which I didn't mention earlier, is that because uh, we used to use a for like a system where we really want to use networking events often in the music business and a lot of in-person events, the acceptance of interacting digitally has become more normal over the course of the pandemic has allowed relationships to form internationally in a way that would probably never happened because of proximity. And let's say difficulty of probably pulling off meetings with people in Mexico or meetings with people in South Africa and all the logistical stuff and the rarity of those things coming together to form a relationship. This potential right now for us to interact probably in the international marketplace in a way which is new and perhaps a little more accessible Mm -hmm. than the formats that were used previously. Uh, which we're starting to see a little bit of seeing people securing contracts more broadly. And we're also seeing kind of 
artists getting picked out of the ether a little bit for management contracts by people who are really actively seeking online because like the artists are shut down. The industry players are also shut down. So those, you know, gatekeepers, the record labels, the A&R people, record labels, the agents, they're kind of scouring, looking the internet, mm. looking for these artists. And, you know, we have a lot of great quality here. And so we're seeing a little uptake that way. So there's some kind of glimmers of light, of flashes of connectivity that are well beyond our, our little provincial borders here. And I think that's exciting attribute of what's happening. Yeah, it sounds like to use the metaphor you used earlier, a little bit of that people are able to get to the island a little bit easier now from the sounds <laughs> of it. Yeah. Stephen, this has been a very insightful conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about that post-COVID-19 world for Manitoba's local art scene. Thank you very much, Ian. Have a great day. Stephen raised some interesting points about the cultural island that is Manitoba's music scene and where it might be heading into the future. It was particularly interesting to observe some of the ideas and their overlap with points raised by Sean McManus in part one of this discussion. Both guests noted how the pandemic has been devastating on the province's musicians and artists. They noted how the online format may continue for more niche audiences and established audiences rather than all artists, big and small. Lastly, even if the touring lifestyle may change after immunity, live music is irreplaceable and cannot and will not be replaced by the online format. As we see images from live events taking place down in the US, I think all Manitobans are looking forward to seeing their first live performance post-pandemic. Because we were talking about Manitoba music, we thought it was necessary to actually hear from the many great talented artists that the province has to offer. If you're listening on UMFM, continue listening. If you're listening on your podcast app, visit the link in today's episode description to hear the full selection of music curated for your listening pleasure by our music coordinator, Neil Kramer. Here is Marin with the track, Very Careful. Thanks for listening to After Immunity. If you're listening on your podcast app, visit the link in today's description to hear the full selection of Manitoba music on umfm.com. A big thanks again to Steve and Carol for coming on today's episode. Tune in next time as we explore Canada's urban environment in the post-COVID-19 world. Host and executive producer is myself, Ian T.D. Thompson. Associate producer and music coordinator is Neil Kramer. After Immunity is a UMFM 101.5 limited series broadcasted out of the University of Manitoba. For more information on the series, visit umfm.com. If you have any thoughts or comments on the series or anything you heard on today's episode, email us at after.immunity at umfm.com.